Good afternoon. I'm delighted you're here. I'm Tom Hyatt, Chair of the Board of Governors of the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And on behalf of the board, which just concluded its May meeting, I'd like to welcome each of you to the 134th annual meeting of the Indianapolis Museum of Art. This has been a tremendous year. Some might even say huge. <laughs> Over the past 12 months, we brought to life our mission to enrich lives through exceptional experiences with art and nature in ways that can only be described as inspired. So let me begin my, rem my remarks by saying that it is, it is you and each of your contributions to this institution which inspire all of us who have the privilege of serving the IMA. I'd like to thank everyone in this room for helping the IMA expand its programming, broaden the impact of our institution on the community, and increase earned income and reduce the draw on the endowment to create a more sustainable business model for the future. I'm particularly pleased to report that our endowment draw is forecasted to be at five and a quarter percent this year a major improvement, as you can see from the slide behind me, from where we were just a few short years ago. We began the year with a celebration of Indiana's bicentennial, a collaboration with our sister institutions around the state. To honor our state's artistic heritage, we created exhibitions that featured the work of 19 artists who were born, raised, or worked in Indiana. At the IMA, guests experienced work by household names like Robert Indiana, whose iconic love sculpture now welcomes guests in Pulliam Family Great Hall, and Michael Graves, who are achieved international fame not only as an architect, but also as a designer of household products for Target and Alessi. Only at the IMA could guests discover works by less recognizable names, like Wilhelmina Sigmüller and Felrath Hines, alongside those of Robert Indiana and Michael Graves. And only at the IMA could guests see the gowns of Fort Wayne's Bill Blass, famous for dressing both Nancy Reagan and Barbara Bush, and could currently admire the fashion creations of Evansville's Halston, the legendary designer of Jackie Kennedy's pillbox hat. And while almost every museum in the state put on a bicentennial exhibition, only at the IMA could guests discover little known facts about Indiana's heritage by playing mini golf. This playful exhibition featured holes designed by local and regional artists, and the course drew nearly 30,000 visitors of all ages from around the community, 64% of whom were under, 30, under 45. In fact, the largest age group uh, was uh, 25 to 34-year-olds. 40% of the visitors had not been to the IMA in more than a year, and for many, it was their first time visiting the campus. This Memorial Day weekend, we will bring back mini golf at the IMA with a new course, again designed by artists. This year's theme, The Natural World, complements our celebration of beauty this spring and summer at the IMA. After 19 stars of Indiana art closed in January, we brightened the winter months with our second annual exhibition of orchids. This year, curators and horticulturalists worked together to paint the entire campus with splashes of color. The display transformed the Madeline Elder Greenhouse into a living gallery of more than 500 blooming orchids and also included a gorgeous and fragrant installation of floral arrangements inside Lily House. 
To complete this campus-wide experience in a tasteful fashion, our Director of Hospitality, Josh Ratliff, arranged an unforgettable evening with, which featured wines and orchid-inspired dishes prepared by local chefs. By the end of these 22 days of color, 80% more visitors had come to the orchid exhibition in the middle of the winter than last year. To put an exclamation point on the year, however, tonight we celebrate not only our 134th annual meeting, but also the launch of the first truly integrated season of experiences at the IMA. This spring, guests have been flocking, one might say, to see Audubon. <laughs> Audubon, drawn to nature, the exhibit in the Allen Whitehall Clues Gallery. The, um, the IMA campus, where art and nature intersect, is perhaps the ideal environment for this exhibition of 75 glorious prints from John James Audubon's masterpiece, The Birds of America described by one of his contemporaries as the greatest monument erected by art to nature. The exhibition is presented by the Eli Lilly and Company Foundation and the Alliance of the IMA. Lead support is provided by Wild Birds Unlimited with contributing support from Gary and Hannah Hirschberg of Goldman Sachs. Support for related educational programs is provided by Crystal DeHaan Family Foundation in honor of the children and families of Crystal House. More than a half a century, excuse me, more than a century and a half after Audubon cataloged the American wilderness in his groundbreaking book, photographer Paula McCartney set off on her own journey into the forests of America. These artists, both of whom capture the natural world in vivid detail, took decidedly different approaches. You can discover McCartney's whimsical photographs in the exhibition Paula McCartney, Birdwatching, on view in the June M. McCormick Forefront Galleries. Support for the McCartney exhibition is provided by David C. and Sarah Jean Ruttenberg Arts Foundation. A third exhibition, The Birds of Celeste Bouzier Bougenon, a film by Ariane Michel is on view in the Lori Ephraimson Aguilera and Sergio Aguilera Gallery. The film celebrates the natural world, world through sound and movement. And finally, as all of you know, surrounding and complementing these exhibitions is Spring Blooms, a celebration of color. This stunning display of a quarter of a million blooms in the garden was made possible by an incredible group of individuals, many of whom are in this room this evening. IMA staff members and dedicated volunteers worked together to plant 150,000 bulbs last fall, the most in the IMA's history, to create an ocean of color this spring. Lead support for this exhibition is provided by Gay and Tony Barkley and Tony and Maria Rose. Additional support is provided by Bob and Tony Bader, Millie Brehob, a King's Art Studio and Gallery, Joyce Pruitt, Sun King Brewery, and Robert and Catherine Turner. Promotional sponsorship is provided by WTHR 13 and in-kind support by Cornegay Design. The project was made possible by a generous gift from Lilly Endowment, Inc. This integrated spring experience has been a shot in the arm for the IMA. <coughs> Membership is up 12% since the beginning of this fiscal year. I'm delighted to share with you the news that at the end of last month, the IMA reached an all-time high of 17,000 423 households, roughly a threefold increase in four years. Sales in the beer garden are exceeding our wildest expectations. <laughs> Another encouraging point of data. 
I want to thank all of the staff members who did double duty, not only to plant the gardens, but to serve the crush of visitors and keep up with strong demand. In all, revenue from admission fees this year is expected to increase 20% over last year. And while these financial results for spring are very encouraging, the smile on the faces of our guests and the reactions from the community are even more gratifying. Anyone who has been here on a busy weekend this spring can share a story with you of guests who were dazzled and charmed by what they saw and experienced. So a big bouquet of thanks to all of you in this room who, through your generosity, have made this growth possible. Your continued support for our mission ensures that the momentum of the IMA will continue, not only at its current pace, but will accelerate, and that the IMA will thrive for generations to come. And now, by, before I turn the podium over to Maria Rose, who will give the nominating and governance committee report, I'd like to thank several groups of leaders for their contributions to the IMA. Please hold your applause for just a moment until we have recognized the following individuals. First, I'd like to thank and recognize three governors who are rotating off the board this year and who have provided exceptional service to the institution. Rick Johnson, Debbie Lilly, and Susan Russell. Next, we owe our gratitude to the individuals who have served as chairs of these board committees and whose names appear on the slide behind me. In addition, we want to thank the many individuals who have served on these committees and given a great deal of time to the museum's business. And finally, we want to thank the presidents of the IMA's affiliate groups. Would all of you whom I've named please stand to be recognized? And now please join me in welcoming Maria Rose to the stage. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you very much, Tom. I want to take uh, this opportunity to thank the other members of the nominating committee for their hard work this year. Um, Ursel, Ozdemir, David Barrett, Matt Gutwein, Robin Nelson Rice, Ian Rupert, and Tamara Zahn. So thank you very much for all your hard work. Our first order of business is to nominate the following governors whose terms of office expire at today's meeting to succeed themselves for a three-year term to expire at the annual meeting of the corporation in May 2020. They are Matt Gutwein, David Eskenazi, Kent Harlock, and Michael Kubaki. The nominating committee also nominates the following individuals to be elected as governors of the IMA for three-year terms to expire at the annual meeting in May 2020. First, Tom Pence. Tom has been a member of IMA's investment committee since 2014. He currently works as a managing director at Stifle Nicholas, specializing in individual investors. Previously, he worked in portfolio management at Strong Capital Management, Conseco Capital Management, and Wells Capital Management. Tom was voted one of IBJ's 40 under 40 in 1998. <laughs> in 2017, Tom joined the Eskenazi Health Foundation. Murda Pulliam. Murda has been involved in the IMA since 1982 has, and has been an active second century society member for 25 years. Murda's significant generosity to the IMA includes the Pulliam Family Great Hall in the new IMA campaign, 
and the annual support for the Wood Pulliam Distinguished Curator, a position formerly held by Ellen Lee. She is also a major dona donor to the Fairbanks Art and Nature Park. Murda is a former member of the Board of Governors, including a term as chair. She is currently a member of the Development Committee, Community and Government Relations Committee, and the Horticulture and Natural Resources Committee. Murda is also a prize-winning journalist who has worked at the Indianapolis Star since 1970, where she serves as Director of Special Projects. Gary Shockett. Gary Shockett has been an IMA member since 1983 and a member of the Second Century Society since 1992. Gary and his wife Phyllis have given generously to the new IMA campaign and the Asian Art Accession Fund. The Shocketts are avid contemporary art collectors and spend the winter in Palm Springs, California, where Gary is a trustee at the Palm Springs Art Museum. He is the chairman of Shockett Hotels, Inc., a management and development organization that owns eight hotels in Indianapolis and throughout the central Indiana region. Gary has served on the board of directors for the Indianapolis Hebrew Congregation, Broadmoor Country Club, and the Bureau of Jewish Education. Sharon Rogers. Sharon has been a member of the IMA since 2016 and currently serves on the Community and Government Relations Committee. Sharon was asked to serve on the Board of Governors as part of CICF's Indianapolis Foundation Fellows Program and is now being elected for a full term. Sharon is the Associate Vice President of Eskenazi Health. Previously, she held many positions with IU Health, including Vice President of Patient Support, Support Services and Executive Director of Environmental Services and Patient Transportation. Sharon also served as Director of Global Real Estate Strategy at Cummins. She serves on the Board of Directors of the Near North Development Corporation, the Indy Hub Foundation, and she was also voted one of the Indianapolis Business Journal's 40 Under 40 in 2013. I move that the nominees for re-election to the board as governors for a three-year term to expire at the annual meeting in May 2020 be re-elected. And I also move that the aforementioned nominees to fill vacancies on the Board of Governors be elected for three-year terms to expire at the annual meeting in May 2020. Please note that only members of the Board of Governors and life trustees are eligible to vote. For the purposes of recording, please identify yourself when seconding. May I have a second? And who are you? Thank you very much, Ian. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. All those against, please signify by raising your hand. Excellent, the motion has carried. At this time, I invite the reelected governors and newly elected governors to stand and be recognized. It's now my pleasure to welcome to the podium Michael Kubaki, the chair of the Finance Committee, who will give that committee's report. Okay, um, I won't go, well, you'll see a bunch of numbers up here, but I won't go through each and every one of them. I think you'll be happy to hear that. But I, what I would like to do is report that the Board, board of Governors, Tom has talked about uh, in his opening remarks here, it's kind of all about the endowment draw. And I'm proud to report that the Board of Governors has adopted a fiscal year 2018 budget that would result in a 5.2% draw on the endowment, following through on our commitment to continued sustainability and responsibility. This is a decrease from the 2017 budgeted draw rate and from the greater than 7% draw of just a few years ago. 
Five years ago, the board set an aggressive goal for reducing the draw on the endowment to 5.5% by fiscal year 2017. This budget represents an almost $1 million outperformance relative to that goal. At the same time, the IMA has a new 10-year goal of reducing the endowment draw to below 4.5%. A focus on increasing earned revenue and continued restraint in operating expenses are the driving forces behind the improved budget forecast. At the same time, the IMA has made significant investments resulting in the growth of its orchid exhibition and in the launch of the highly successful Spring Blooms program. The 2018 budget helps to ensure the IMA's ability to provide exceptional art and nature experiences in the future to residents of central Indiana and visitors alike. The IMA is also on pace to slightly outperform the fiscal year 2017 budget. Growth in annual memberships and general admission revenue over the past year has been driven by our dedication to exceptional exhibitions such as Audubon Drawn to Nature and the growth in garden programming such as Spring Blooms. We are also benefiting from continued restraint on expenses. The IMA expects to finish fiscal year 2017 approximately $1 million under budgeted expenditures. Fiscal year 2018 expenses are expected to increase only modestly, even as we continue to invest in our facilities and programs. And we have achieved these goals even as the investment markets showed restraint, I guess that's the best way we could, restraint in the most recent two years. Uh, in calendar year 2016, the IMA's endowment portfolio earned approximately 6.9% after experiencing virtually no gain in calendar year 2015 as markets continued to be choppy. This further incentivizes us to redouble our efforts to reduce our draw on the endowment to a more conservative level. And this allows the IMA to be better stewards of our donors' generous support, preserving and growing your investment and allowing for the future of the growth of available funds for public programs and exhibitions. And while the IMA's financial position continues to improve, it is important to note that, that we continue to be impacted with a high level of debt. We have approximately $100 million of debt, a substantial amount for an institution of our size. The, the interest costs alone uh, amount to more than $3.1 million per year, money that is unavailable to use for exhibitions, education, or other public programming. This past November, you may remember, the IMA made its first substantial payment toward reducing the debt by prepaying more than $15 million of principal. I can also report that the Board of Governors approved a plan of finance that would pay a, 30, a further $45 million of principal over the next seven years. This will help propel us toward greater financial sustainability in the long term and is part of a 10-year financial plan that we are developing. So thank you for your continued support of the IMA. I'll now turn the podium back over to Tom Hyatt. This is truly a walk-on role. My primary job is to introduce Charles Venable. <laughs> the museum's CEO, who will give you an update. Thanks, Charles. Well, this isn't quite a walk-on role, but I'm, I, I'm a bit player today. David Rubin um, is going to be the main star uh, of our annual meeting in just a few minutes. But before I introduce David, um, I want to take this moment to give you a little bit of an idea about the wonderful acquisitions that we have made here at the IMA over the past year, as well as introduce you to some new faces who are now part of Team IMA. Thanks to patrons who have donated funds for the purchase of art and to generous collectors who have given works of art, the IMA acquired over 400 art objects during the past year for the permanent collection. You had a glimpse of some of those new acquisitions in the slideshow when you first entered the Toby. And if you took two glasses of wine, they may have seen like more than 400, um, but that was the whole point. 
I now want to just highlight just a few works of art that came into the collection out of that 400 to give you an idea of the great span of art that we collect here and that we continue to be devoted in collecting. One of the first and one of the oldest works of art that entered our collection in the past year is this beautiful 12th century Chinese tea bowl featuring an incredible brown glaze called hare's fur, which was the gift of Dr. Shirley Muller. Besides this wonderful gift, Shirley's collection of exceptional Chinese export porcelain will be on exhibition at Lily House um, over the summer into the fall, and I know you won't want to miss that. Advancing in time by about 400 years, we received an exceptionally rare tapestry along with a group of paintings from the Clues Fund. The original design for this textile was done by the famous Renaissance Italian artist, Raphael, on order of Pope Leo X to decorate the Sistine Chapel. Like the Vatican version, the Clues tapestry depicts the New Testament story of the miraculous drought of fishes showing Christ and his disciples fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And the work dates to about 1630. While speaking of the Clues family legacy at the IMA, I also want to take this opportunity to thank both the Clues Fund and the Allen Whitehill Clues Charitable Foundation for a combined grant of $3 million that will allow us to completely renovate the 1971 Clues Pavilion. It will also allow us to complete the long-awaited catalog of Clues, the Clues collection of old master paintings that is so well known. I think we should give a round of applause to both of the foundations and the family members for their extreme generosity this year. <laughs> Staying in the 17th century for just another moment, we all re also received a wonderful drawing as a gift from Markham Roberts and the Kane Foundation here in Indianapolis that depicts the Palace of Versailles with its short-lived water garden designed by the king's landscape architect, André Le Nôtre. This will be the next building project during my administration. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The endowment drawer will not be going up to Bill Versailles, I can, or to recreate the water gardens. But we are the only people who own now the drawings for them, I suppose. It can be in David's future planning. So if we move ahead another 200 years, um, by that time, the young United States, that was a twinkle in the eye, practically, of King Louis XIV, had grown up to be one of the great industrial powers of the world, and by the 1880s was the largest producer of great silver goods in the world. Donald Norris and his late wife, Lois, presented the IMA with a lovely group of pieces made by the Gorham Manufacturing Company that included this coffee set in the Turkish style. And based on that, I can assure you coffee drinking was definitely more elegant before Starbucks invented <laughs> coffee in a cup. Now, while our Wood Pulliam Senior Curator of European Art, Ellen Lee, actually left the collection after 45 years of service, thanks to the Maisie Eden Power Endowment Fund, the IMA has been able to honor Ellen's amazing career through the acquisition of a great neo-impressionist painting by the Dutch artist Johannes Arts. Like a great curator, Ellen had been tracking this picture for literally years, hoping to bag it someday for the IMA. So it is a perfect tribute to her work. So I think we also need to give Ellen a great round of applause. and thank the Power family for making this acquisition in her honor possible. This picture is currently being cleaned and will be in our galleries as soon as it comes out of the conservation studios. Moving on in time still further, our generous donor Stephen Conant presented the IMA with a fine print by the avant-garde modernist Laszlo Maholinage in honor of our works on paper curator Marty Krauss 
for which we are very, very grateful. Maholi Naj was one of the artists who basically invented modernism uh, along with Kandinsky and um, several other artists working at the early part of the 20th century. From the mid 20th century, we were fortunate to acquire a series of wonderful works. This dress by the American designer Claire McArdle was given by the Blatt Family Foundation. We received a great example of a diamond chair by Harry Bertoya, given by Leonard and Alice Berkowitz. And in this group, finally, James Rosenquist's iconic F111 pop art print came into the collection along with a large group of other wonderful modernist prints given by Kay Cook. Finishing up our time travel is an exceptional threesome of art, including this masterful print by the American artists Robert Longo as a gift from Joan and Walter Wolfe, an ethereal suite of medicine drawings by the composer artist John Cage which is a gift of Anne Stack in honor of Marty Krauss. And finally, this powerful pastel by the Indiana artist, born artist Gayla Irwin, a touching portrait of her mother as she lay dying in hospice besides the artist's dog, Fanny. While not a new acquisition, I must also mention this year's conservation of Robert Indiana's famous love that Tom alluded to earlier. The sculpture now looks wonderful in the Pulliam family great court, thanks to the generosity of the Lacrosse family. Shown here, cutting the ribbon at a recent love fest <laughs> that the IMA gave in honor of the piece's conservation, which truly would not have been possible without the lacrosses and their family's generosity, but also the extremely talented conservators that we have on staff who worked for several months to move this several ton object, um, take it apart, and basically, shall we say, put it all back together again. So thank you all for all your work and for your generosity. In conclusion, I would like to introduce you to several of our new colleagues here at the IMA, who some of you may not have had a chance to meet yet as they arrived during this past year. Shelley Salem came from the Cranbrook Art Museum in Michigan to join us as our new Associate Curator of Design and Decorative Arts. Josh Ratliff came to us from Cummins to become our first ever Director of Hospitality. It's also kind of cool that he's a gold-level sommelier, so maybe wine will get better as the evening gets longer. Um, <laughs> Jeremy Shoebrook came north from the Arsh Center for Performing Arts in Miami to become our first ever director of festivals, performance, and public programs. And to, conti oops, sorry. And to continue to build our fundraising capabilities, Wendy Harlow, formerly from Butler, joined our advancement team as director of philanthropy. We also have two promotions that I want you to help me celebrate tonight. The first, Grace, um, Grace Miles, who many of you know for her management of our membership department, is now spreading her wings as our first ever director of donor experiences. And that should be telling all of you as members that your experiences as donors are going to get even better here, because Grace is terrific at that. And in the case of our extraordinary Deputy Director of Collections, Exhibitions, and Facilities, Katie Haig, I am honored to announce her promotion to the position of Chief Operating Officer. Congratulations to all of you for joining Team I <laughs> Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce David Rubin, the principal of David Rubin Land Collective in Philadelphia, who you might already know from his terrific work at Eskenazi Hospital. David and his team have been helping us think about the IMA 30 years into the future and how we can use all of our many buildings, gardens, and park to best of their advantage in ways that make it possible to enrich lives through exceptional experiences with art and nature.
please welcome David Rubin. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Wonderful. It's an honor to stand here um, to have participated in an extraordinary collaboration uh, to envision what might be in association with the IMA. Um, I came to know the IMA um, in my experiences working uh, with Matt Goodwine on envisioning a campus for Eskenazi and indeed um, have had the opportunity to collaborate with Maria at Cummins in the establishment of the DBU headquarters downtown. Um, and in doing so, coming from Philadelphia, which is my hometown, was finding opportunities actually between meetings to actually uh, seek out respite and recharge. And indeed, the place that I kept coming to was the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And as someone who um, received his education in the fine arts and in the history art of art and eventually became a landscape architect, the notion of finding a place that embraces art and nature equally is an extraordinary opportunity for me as a designer and someone who loves to collaborate and engage in relationship building for long-term successes of uh, places that we all engage in. One of the things that I think is really interesting about the IMA is actually that um, uh, it has an opportunity for everyone. Um, I found it for respite and recharge and a, a chance to actually think about what I needed to do in, in my uh, daily career, um, working uh, here and at other places. Uh, but really, the assets associated with the IMA are quite broad. Indeed, we call them a constellation of assets on our team. And it's this notion that um, this, this campus, which is extraordinarily broad in its holdings, has opportunities for so many. And indeed, there is really no reason why anyone should not be a member of the Indianapolis Museum of Art. It really has everything for everybody. And indeed, part of the charge for, uh, of my task is actually to find those opportunities in experience, in programming, in the uplift of secondary or perhaps even tertiary spaces within this extraordinary campus to make them a primary experience for the engagement of both art and nature. So uh, you know the campus very well, I'm sure. Um, obviously, there is the main campus comprised of the museum and Oldfield, uh, but also of the Virginia B. Fairbanks Art and Nature Park. Uh, for the pur purpose of this discussion, I call them the upper and lower campus, if you will. But it also includes the Westerly House, uh, and as well as the Miller House in Columbus, Indiana. Um, and so there really is this notion that it is an extraordinarily broad um, opportunity for, for people to engage. I just want to take you through some things that resonated with me almost immediately. I have to acknowledge that the, the, the um, vision plan is actually a tome. It's very thick, uh, and we're continuing to finish editing it. Um, this is a glimpse of some of those opportunities that we have found. And indeed, part of it is very emotional and reactionary to elements that really are perhaps um, to some of you and to me, diamonds in the rough that could be lifted up to become extraordinary opportunities. And indeed, some other experiences that could make it even more engaging in the context of art and nature. So it might be rethinking how people enter into this building in particular, or um, aspects of connectivity um, in terms of the productive nature of the landscape that actually supported uh, Old Field. Or in fact, thinking about um, support areas such as um, facilities and finding opportunities where people might engage with that as well. Because indeed, the extraordinary energy that it takes to actually make this a successful and rewarding and enriching place um, really deserves to be seen in terms of the construct of it. So what are the opportunities that might be found within that arena? This is actually the plan that we've come up with. Um, you might think it very subtle in terms of its changes, but I think some of the gestures are quite profound. Some are gonna be very simple to implement. They'll be really strategic, bold moves that won't cost a lot, but will have significant impact. And some are more far-reaching and thoughtful about what the future might be, but actually be a guide towards getting um, to that, that end state. Um, so I wanna take you through some of those things um, as we have envisioned them in the context of this framework plan. 
One of the first things is, is recognizing that we really will be successful in what we do here. It's going to be very, very uh, um, far reaching in terms of the invitation to have people come and participate. So let's consider how to deal with parking, something pragmatic like that. And indeed, in advance of finding the need to actually construct something um, that is three dimensional, maybe there's opportunity to, re to reinforce turf um, such that it can actually receive overflow of cars on those days when um, an event is being celebrated um, and there is actually no, uh, not enough marked uh, uh, car places. So in this case, we're looking at the area in and around Newfield where we can actually reinforce the turf, allow the turf to grow up around it, and occasionally park cars there so that people don't have to be bussed onto the site, right? That they can actually find an easy walk to get where they want to go. Um, another is to reconsider um, the fact that the embrace of both art and nature should be perceived equally and be experienced equally. So in this cutaway of, um, here's Sutphin Fountain here, um, here is um, the, the uh, cafe. Indeed, we, we move through um, Ephraimson um, into ticketing and then presently uh, make our way to the gardens. But maybe there's an opportunity actually to create greater clarity and ease with which people can enter the museum and either choose to go to the gardens first or choose to the go, go to art. And so um, that being said, perhaps we might embrace Sutphin Fountain um, and have a really uh, uh, strategic entrance into what is presently the cafe by piercing through that glazed facade and actually allowing people to move freely in and out of the building in that extraordinary court. Um, and in doing so, um, welcome visitors to an experience of both art and nature where you might choose to go right and go directly into the gardens, or you might choose to go left and up into the galleries. Um, but in this sort of welcoming, uh, jubilant environment, um, I think it's a, an extraordinary opportunity to get people engaged in both art and nature um, right past the threshold. And as was mentioned by Charles, uh, the Robert Indiana uh, sculpture has been moved. And indeed, um, while we were thinking about the plan, um, this was something that was in the machinations. And uh, the, the team actually began to coin the phrase, love is at the heart of the IMA. Because indeed, its position is actually potentially strategic, where it, as an icon of art and this beautiful, empathetic, piece of sculpture can actually be a wayfinding device um, in a clearly delineated approach towards how visitors engage with art and understand where they are in the context of the building. So indeed, um, this beautiful repositioning um, could be seen as a strategic move in its position here for a much more clear understanding of the gallery system and indeed opportunity to re-engage the exterior so that people can see where they are in the context of the museum by understanding what is outside. And in doing so, actually um, re-engage the numbers fountain and the sculpture, uh, sorry, the numbers uh, terrace and the sculpture terrace in such a way that you can move freely around through and um, up into the museum itself and that these broader corridors um, have sight lines that go in and out of the building and also strategically land on pieces of art as you move through those experiences. So reading the museum becomes much more um, clear and uh, the emotional response as you engage with pieces of art um, is not hampered by a concern of, I really don't know where I am relative to where I started, right? So the simple reading and readjustment of how one experiences the museum can be quite strategic. Um, that might manifest itself, again, in terms of where we, re where we puncture the building to actually get people outside again and embrace the Numbers Terrace, an area that is less visited than perhaps it should be, and indeed um, strategically linking galleries so that people can move freely and understand, again, opportunities for engaging different aspects of the gallery system. In a similar way, we want to rethink how people experience the exterior of this building and indeed the breadth of the campus. So in this case, perhaps it's rethinking the position of uh, the Noni Garden and actually how people enter into the property and also give people an opportunity to easily access both the amphitheater and the art and nature park by giving them 
uh, a beautiful uh, uh, landscape experience around the building that strategically gets through compliance um, people um, to the back of the property, and indeed an opportunity to engage in this case the amphitheater. That experience might be um, quite unique in terms of its context of a very rich landscape that is uh, ignored presently. Indeed, as the landscape drops off into uh, the area of the canal, it's quite a rich wooded environment, and perhaps even the way in which people move through that space um, in compliance, again, uh, could be quite uplifting, where you actually have um, a, an experience within the woods that is actually emblematically marked with art. So that the amphitheater, and indeed the location of where that lands, might look more like this and that indeed people can actually move strategically into the amphitheater. Um, we can have concessions back there because we rethink how rooms within the building are utilized and expressed on the exterior, and indeed perhaps even uh, get folks um, it, um, onto the terraces with a new lit condition or indeed a new um, acoustical system. So this could be uh, a very strategic move in embracing uh, a, an area of the, the campus that actually is underutilized presently. Um, in, in a similar vein, so that leaving the amphitheater, we actually could cross the canal strategically to actually embrace the art and nature park. So you, where you've parked your car here, you can actually easily move down and across and into the art and nature park, something that people strive to do now but are foiled by obstacles in the way. <laughs> so. Um, in thinking about that, that bridge that comes across might alight upon a landform that actually um, serves to bring people down into the park, but also creates a new threshold um, from the existing parking area into um, the art and nature park. So indeed, um, it also becomes a vantage point from which to see down into the park a unique situation um, from the present condition. And so this notion of welcoming becomes quite strategic. Indeed, if we are thinking empathetically about how people embrace art and nature, one should feel welcome at every moment. And presently, a simple move might be to remove the sign at the front of the lily house that says, please go around. That's not a way to welcome people, right? Let's move people in through the front door and indeed have an experience of that, that great house um, in a way that um, really respects um, both the house and the, way, and the way in which people engage in it. And when you've moved through the house, maybe the, we could utilize the back terrace in a strategic way simply by modifying the landscape on the opposite side of the canal, because presently, when you're sitting on that back terrace, you have no concept that actually the art and nature part is this extraordinary other half of this campus, right? And indeed, just by creating an activities lawn, a festival lawn here, um, you create a relationship between the terrace and the house, its position on the canal towpath, and indeed its position relative to the art and nature park, and perhaps even some distant future deployment of sculpture. So that indeed, this, the experience could be something more like this. And that is not a difficult move to make. That's actually a very strategic, simple, easily read, easily understood way of reading this campus and experiencing it as a whole. Because indeed, this terrace suddenly becomes the axis mundi, the point of center of this entire campus. And indeed, quite a spectacular opportunity to gather with family and friends. Similarly, on the opposite side is the uh, existing fountain, which, uh, as we've learned through some of the historic documents, was actually intended to be significantly more grand than the sprinkling fountain that it is presently. Indeed, also when you're out there, which I've been many times, it really shifts your perspective uh, and relationship to the house, and it, actually, most people don't get out there. So why not reconfigure the woodland walk, indeed, to embrace an area of occupation around the historic fountain um, that actually um, allows people to engage in it quite significantly, so that indeed your experience of the Lily House becomes absolutely different than what you presently understand. And indeed, the fountain itself can be reconfigured, not by modifying its current circular uh, form, but actually by bringing back the original intent of the jet d'eau and this sort of dancing opportunities of water in terms of a, a really beautiful, engaged terminus to the house itself. So in addition to uh, 
uh, those elements uh, that are enriching within the campus, there's actually some aspects of palimpsest, of the things that have been written and written again and erased and written again on, on the campus. One of those is actually the interurban trail which for uh, some of you may realize is the old trolley system that used to connect downtown with some of the suburbs and some of the adjacent towns. Indeed, if you walk through the gardens, it probably is something that you don't realize is happening, um, that indeed there is this little berm that separates the old interurban from the, the roadway. Uh, but it's actually an extraordinary opportunity and easily changed into something quite wonderful. So in thinking about how old infrastructure has been utilized, not dissimilar to the um, inspirational uh, transformation of the High Line, so too this old railway corridor could become something quite magical, quite distinctly um, the Indianapolis Museum of Art and Indianapolis as a whole, because this area has um, a rich history in that where we have the 42nd Street Bridge, which exists, and some of you may recognize it, this is actually the landscape of the interurban beneath it. And indeed, that um, bridge is quite beautiful in its sort of japanese effect, this old iron bridge that has been deployed. Not dissimilar to, say, Monet's bridge um, in his garden, or indeed Hokusai's bridge, right? But, it, but like Van Gogh, this landscape beneath could become quite extraordinary it could become a place of celebration not only in the spring, but actually throughout the seasons where a line of cherry trees might be dropping the confetti of petals or in the winter time, a celebration of lights that moves down. But indeed, this makes um, prospectively uh, the campus uh, connections uh, quite dynamic because if, a trolley, if an old trolley car can actually make this descent, so can the existing tram, which then offers opportunity for people to experience the campus in an even broader sense. More, uh, some ideas are set towards the future, right? Towards things that might be more grand, more uh, uh, require uh, a little bit more funding, are, uh, are opportunities for the future of the museum. One of them actually is a celebration of uh, the productive landscape that used to support the Oldfield estate. And indeed, marrying um, two um, areas to each other, uh, the orchard um, and the greenhouses, by expanding um, into a potager's garden, which is a highly designed productive landscape um, that might enrich aspects of the um, both philosophical and nutritional um, uh, growth of the, of the campus itself, including perhaps even the expansion of greenhouses. So this is a, 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 a wonderful vision for what might be in terms of the quality and character of that portion of the campus. And indeed, um, it might uh, afford opportunities for programming beyond um, growing uh, horticulture within the greenhouses. Perhaps it even adds to programming opportunities and opportunities for events. Um, the old barn, actually, which is now uh, holds facilities functions, um, could actually be uh, re. Oops, sorry, mm, got to go back. Uh, could be re-engaged uh, and repurposed to actually bring the culinary arts into play in the context of a rethinking of that beautiful old barn structure. And indeed, this is what I meant by thinking about um, re-engaging um, aspects of facilities um, and the uplift of this campus as a as a sort of uh, aspect of engagement for uh, the constituents. So too, there could be off of the numbers terrace uh, and the back uh, amphitheater, an opportunity to engage uh, a children's garden where we actually, while parents might be uh, focused on an event uh, in the amphitheater, uh, children might be experiencing art and nature in this extraordinary overlook uh, landscape uh, in, in the back uh, sculpture court. Um, which would uh, bring children into a relationship of horticulture and art at an early age and enrich them and enrich our own experiences of joy watching them go through explorations. So that that might be envisioned as some fanciful um, uh, arena in which play and exploration uh, and discovery actually holistically uplift um, our youngest uh, members. Or indeed, for all of you, it might be the experiencing of, experience of going up to the roof of this extraordinary building and experiencing the Indiana, Indianapolis landscape um, in an event on top of um, 
uh, the, uh, above the fourth floor in the museum building where we might hold events not dissimilar to the way that they do at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, um, uh, looking from the rooftop uh, not only to the distant horizon line but actually to art that might be deployed on walls that are presently not utilized uh, at all but could be quite enriching uh, as well. So the plan itself is very comprehensive. As I said, it is a tome. It explores opportunities within uh, this physical building uh, um, as uh, opportunities for change uh, and, and growth, but also um, throughout the campus. And indeed, as you can see, it's you know, 54 plus ideas about what could be. So um, that's a very fast glimpse about um, a future vision for this campus. I welcome the opportunity to engage in conversation with you in questions um, in the beer garden after this. I'll be happy to have discussions um, over a, a, a Maria Rose informed beer garden. <laughs> uh, that would be wonderful. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, he and I will be out in the, by the Madeline Elder Greenhouses shortly, um, and we'll be happy to have conversations or answer any of your questions. Um, I must admit, over the last year, I've become more and more thrilled to think what this place could look like in 30 years, just even if we did a portion of the wonderful ideas that David and his team and the IMA team have come up with. Um, however, I'm also thrilled to think about what we already are and where we've been over the last 50 years. Um, while the IMA is 134 years young this year, everything that David has been working with in terms of architecture and landscape has come to the IMA or been created here at the IMA in just the last 50 years. That's less than the average lifespan of any one of us. That is because of you and your commitment to this unique institution where art and nature come together like nowhere else. Whether it's the life-changing experience with art, and nature, art in our galleries, as this father on the screen with his young child might be having, or that perhaps life-changing first date <laughs> that you might have in the gardens or Fairbanks Park, the IMA is really here to enhance your life and those of our fellow citizens. This fall, we will do that by presenting an art form that uses the city itself as its canvas. And we will illuminate our beautiful gardens for the first time to create a new holiday tradition here in Indianapolis. None of this would be possible without your support those people, companies, and foundations who have supported our wonderful inaugural spring bloom season are listed here on the screen. On behalf of the staff and our Board of Governors, I want to personally thank all of these generous donors and to thank all of you for supporting this great jewel in the crown of Indianapolis and for coming today. Now it's my great pleasure to invite you out to enjoy spring at the IMA's Madeline F. Elder Greenhouse to toast a very, very successful year and raise a glass to an exciting future. Thank you very much. Thank you.